Good morning again. It is good to be together this morning. If you have your Bibles, be turning with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11 is where we're going to be this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Let's read this together this morning. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. The skin horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the other toys. He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed the seams underneath, and most of the hairs in his tail had been pulled out to string bead necklaces. He was wise, for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger and by and by, break their mainsprings and pass away. And he knew that they were only toys and would never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful, and only those playthings that are old and wise and experienced, like the skin horse, understand all about it. What is real? Asked the Velveteen Rabbit one day when they were lying side by side. Does it mean having things that buzz inside of you or a stick out handle? Real isn't how you're made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? Oh, it doesn't happen all at once, said the wise skin horse. You become. It takes a long, long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. One of my favorite books outside of the Bible is The Velveteen Rabbit. It was written by Marjorie Williams and first published in 1922. And it's, it's become one of the very classic stories of all time that teaches us as adults, I believe, as well as children about life situations and typical events of life that happen to us. Some of us relate to some of those things. Our eyes popping out and our hair falling loose and becoming loose in the joints and getting a little worn shabby. We, we relate to that, we understand, but we do that because this is real life that we're living. This young boy receives a stuffed bunny rabbit in his stocking and it's covered with velveteen, a very inexpensive cloth material that they made animals out of it. it was, not to be one of the more expensive things. You know, one of those last-minute toys that you buy children to put in their stockings. And it's a great and wonderful tradition at our house to, to have the stockings. I love stockings. Some of the greatest things I ever got in my, in my life came in my stockings. And you can visibly tell that those were some of the things that I enjoyed the most. It's usually where the chocolate peanuts were and the Butterfingers, and the, uh, the Lifesaver boxes. Anybody ever get Lifesaver? I used to get those. I, mean, I got those every Christmas. They were gone in an hour, but I loved all 10 packages of them. 
But this segment of the book from the Velveteen Rabbit talks to us about what it means in nursery magic to become real. And I'll never forget the first time I heard this story because it meant so much to me. And I, I started getting ready for this lesson in this last week as I studied, and, and Chris did a magnificent job last week and appreciate the fine message he did. But I walked in sometime early, later in the week and was going to come out here and, and practice this lesson, and I went, wow, I didn't know this was going to be up here. I'm going to be talking about the Velveteen Rabbit, and there's not one rabbit in here. And then a voice spoke in my head and said, Dummy, they didn't do this for you. But isn't it beautiful? Our children are going to be graduating from Hilltop School tonight, and they're having their closing program, and, and this is part of it. But I got to looking in these bushes over here. I thought I heard something scurrying around, and there's nothing there. But anyway, I, I, I started thinking about what does it mean to be real? And it would be strange if we had a real rabbit just all of a sudden pop out of here, wouldn't it? It's not going to happen under my watch. Now, if somebody found out about it and it happens, it's not me doing it. But I got to thinking about how it mean, what it means to be real spiritually. And I asked the question, am I real? Am I real? Am I living the life that I need to live? What does it mean to be real? I mean, have you ever really stopped to think about it? What does it mean to be real? Or maybe you've asked the question that so many teenagers ask their parents, why was I ever born? I heard that at least 15 times from my children. I never said it as a child, more than once a day. But as we go through life, we want to know, why are we here? And what is it about this life that's so special? Where is my place? We all want to know what it means. Where do I fit in? Am I loved? Am I real? Am I the the person that I need to be? Am I trying too hard? Am I not trying hard enough? Is it coming across? Is my point getting there? Am I being the right kind of father? We ask all those questions. But I think one of the most important that we need to ask is, am I real? Am I real? I believe that over the years we've all become familiar with the idea of what it means to be real when it comes to the idea of truth in the church. We know that it's the Word of God. We talked about it in Bible class this morning, that there are so many people in this world that do not believe that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God. And it comes from a lack of faith. Our faith should be that this is the inerrant Word of God. It's God-breathed. God gave it to us. And we need to believe that and accept that and be, to have it work in our lives. But have we ever considered what it means to be real in our spiritual lives? What is real spirituality for us? And do we consider... That is a part of being real in our faith. Real isn't how you're made. When we become real, it isn't something that happens to all of us. Real takes time, but it isn't how you're made. We have to become spiritually real. And it does take time. We become real by realizing that we, we fail. In Romans 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Folks, every one of us, that kind of states it, doesn't it? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Realizing our ability to fail, at least I believe, has to carry over to understanding that the men who lead this congregation are also going to fail at times. And we've been going through this process. It's nothing new. And we've talked about this. And the men that lead this congregation, we need to know that it's important to realize that we can't hold them above ourselves. They don't need to be put on a pedestal and meet certain requirements after their elders. They are going to be on their knees serving this congregation and leading through their example. But yet when they make mistakes, we've got to be the ones to stand there and lift them up and help them. 
Just like we want them to help us when we make our mistakes. Are we without sin? Are we the ones that are living without sin? I don't think so. And we need to know that. And we need to be ready to help these men. They are going to have to overcome a lot of things in their lives. That's just life. We are God's creation, created in His image, according to Genesis 1 and verse 26. We're created in the image of God. We are also the objects of His love, His kindness, His grace, His forgiveness, <laughs> and probably the biggest one of all, His patience. Somebody asked me one time, why do you think it is that God has not come back yet? Isn't the world ready? Haven't we had enough sin in our lives in the world in, in, in the worst state it's ever been? What is it that's keeping God away? And I believe the word is patience. God doesn't want anybody to die without him in their lives. He wants all men to be saved. We have to be patient. We have to understand This is who we are. We're people, humans, but we're also Christians, children of God, given over to a life that says, I may not do it perfectly, and I may not do it the best as anybody else, but I'm going to do what I do for God, and I'm going to bless Him with my life and thank Him for what He's given me. That's what it's about. Anything other than that, we're beating ourselves up because we can't live under the old law anymore. And it required perfection. And my God does not require perfection in my life, but he requires me to be perfect through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the way he's going to see me. This is who we are. Being real in our Christianity should never mean that we must be in line with modern philosophy, modern religious ideas, or any moral world traditions or things that happen. Real comes from being in love with God. And we as a congregation need to be in love with God. We need to be who God wants us to be. It is a kingdom thought that we must have. It's a kingdom thought. It's a thought that, that we need to have God in our lives and we need to be a part of the kingdom, the family of God. And it needs to be who we are. That it just, it just just exudes from us. People ought to be able to ask us, what is wrong with you? When in reality, what they ought to be asking is, what is right with you? Because they'll be able to see it. But see, the world doesn't see things like that. They don't see the joy that should exude from our lives because sometimes we don't show it. We become worried. And like the little velveteen rabbit, well, what does it take? And it doesn't happen overnight. And it does take a long time to be what God wants us to be. But you don't stop being because you aren't yet. You don't stop trying to be because you haven't attained it yet. It's a long process. It's a growing process. I remember one of my bosses whenever I lived here, and if he ever sees this, he'll deny it was intimidated by his mother, who was his boss. Great lady. Lady's name is Miss Cameron, Evelyn Cameron. And the company was T.B. Britt Lumber Company. It used to be over on the north side. And Doug Boyce, her son, was a great guy. I loved Doug. Doug and I were good friends for a long time. We, we got along fine. But I want to tell you something. He was intimidated by his mother. So he would do things without telling her. And it was the first time I ever heard the statement, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is permission. You ever heard that? I learned that from him. I heard that from him. I learned that it's not really a good idea. Because I saw what it did to him physically and, and mentally. Folks, we just need to get to the point where we're asking for forgiveness. And to realize that that's not the lifestyle that we need in our lives. That that's not the mentality. The mentality is, is that it's a kingdom thought that we need to have. We ha need to have God in our thoughts. We, everything that we do, we need to ask ourselves, is that what I need to do for God? Is that the direction that I need to go with God? Is this where God, God is leading me? And somebody says, well, I can't do that with everything. And I'm asking, why not? 
I had a guy tell me one time, not every decision that you make, you have to go to God in prayer for us. And well, why not? He's there. He already knows us. He's leading us. He's wanting us to be his. It's an understanding that love comes through what God has done for us. John, verse 316, for God so loved the world world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 4, verse John 4 and verse 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The sacrifice has been paid. All we have to do is accept it and ask for that forgiveness when we mess up. It takes commitment to serve others who are not real. And even those who are not yet Christians. Romans 12, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor for the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, here it is. Live at peace with everyone. Look at what is said here. This is our situation here at West Freeway. We need to understand that this is a kingdom lifestyle, not a list of commands of do's and don'ts. We need to desire to have inside of us and strive for these attributes and be who we are meant to be in Christ. Question, how are you doing? How are you doing in that situation? How are we doing as a congregation? Are we where we need to be? Sometimes becoming a real Christian may hurt. I know a lot of people who have left congregations, moved on because they were hurt. I know a lot of people like that. And that's not easy. It happens. And it's sinful. And folks, if we have to hurt people to get our point across, then we're being selfish. I'm not talking about the word hurting. I'm talking about us hurting. If our actions are deliberately pointed at someone to hurt them, then we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The world hurts us enough. We don't need to help it. We need to overcome that. And we need to do whatever it is that stops it. But we need to do it in love. Do people need correction every once in a while? Absolutely. I do. But there's a whole lot of difference in coming to me and saying, Brother, let's sit down and talk about this and visit and, and, and let's love each other and be who we need to be. Then to come to me and say, as a friend of mine did once, You know what I don't like about you? And I said, No what? <laughs> I've always been an idiot sometimes when it comes to that. I've asked that question. Somebody says that, I'm always, I will know what. A good friend of mine told me one time that, you know, a lady came up to him and said he was moving on. And he, he, they came up to him and said, hey, we need, before you leave, we've got some things we want to talk to you about. And he said, all right. So they set up a meeting. And he thought that they were just going to park company and they just had something to say. He said, we want you to know these things that we've held against you since you've been here. And they pulled out a notebook. 
And he let them get all the way through it. And he looked at them and said, you don't love me, do you? And they said, yeah, we love you. That's why we're here. We want you to know that these are things that you're doing wrong and have been doing wrong all along. He said, you don't love me. They said, what do you mean? How do you know we don't love you? This is why we're doing this. He said, well, then you don't understand love. Because if I'm not mistaken, he said, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, love keeps no record of wrong. How are we doing, folks? Is that love? Is that kingdom thinking? Is that being a part of the family the way God wants us to be? Sometimes being real, a real Christian may hurt. Why? Because some who to us seem real are not. But God's love is perfect in us if we're real. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. Or verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by love. Loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. He takes away the world's reality. Without loving others whom God loves, we can't be real Christians. And we can't have those types of leaders who do not love the brethren. Who are not willing to lead the brethren. Not only in this church, but any church. We need to be men and leaders who can lead through love. Those who keeps God's commands would then be those God would consider real. How are we doing? Should we expect to hurt if we're real? If we're really Christians, should we expect to hurt? Well, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard pressed on every side. But not crushed. Perplexed. But not in despair. Persecuted but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life, so that his life, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal life body. Real doesn't mind being hurt by those who aren't real. See, we all have those whom we like and even some we love who will never decide to be real Christians. It happens. How do you treat them? Well, you treat them with love and encouragement, never condescending, nor with the idea of cutting them off. And men who lead with love always do more good than anyone who divides by cutting and destroying. To be real means that we must be made to keep our reality pure and open for others to see. Philemon 1 verse 6, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. 
Folks, we need the people who share our faith so that we can have a fuller understanding of the things that we've been given in Christ as a child of God. We need that. We must be real always. We must be real always. But becoming real doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. In Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30, we find that Jesus writing here and, or speaking here says, suppose if you wants to build a tower, will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was unable to finish. It takes time, preparation. It's never an overnight success story. It takes true commitment. Real Christians and real Christian leaders must put God first in every aspect of their lives, their time, their money, their desires. It takes that type of commitment to serve others who are not who they think you or who you think they ought to be, but that's what is needed. This is becoming real by being real to God. Through being real Christians, living real Christian lives out of love for God by realizing who we are and whose we are, by realizing that God is the one that makes us real and he does it by loving us, and because of that love, he offers that, that forgiveness that comes through his son. That's where we come to an understanding that it takes commitment. That is becoming real by being real to God. He helps us to see the need to have men in leadership that will be compassionate, loving, caring, and joyful in spirit. He helps us also through that to love the unlovable. Real isn't how you're made. It comes by being loved and giving love. And this is who we're supposed to be as real Christians. Some fine men have decided not to serve. We have other fine men who have stepped up and said, I'm ready. We have a congregation of loving Christians who are ready to be led into the future. I don't think there's anyone here who wants to see us fail. And therefore, we ask God to be our leader, to be the one that we turn to. Our shepherds and elders need to be the same way in which Paul truly received his realness. And that is to receive it from God. Because God understands us, he loves us, and does so with enough fervor that his love makes us real. No, it's not nursery magic. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen easily to those who break easily. It's a kingdom love. It's a kingdom power. And with that same love and that same power, we should love him back. We should also love each other that much. I believe that that's what God is talking about. I appreciate so much the work that we have to do together. I see the future of this congregation not in numbers, but in spiritual maturity. And if we are to become the spiritually mature people that we will be, then we're going to have to be led there. Whether it comes from the congregation, from our eldership, it has to come from God. I don't know where you are this morning. I hope that you're real. I hope that in your Christianity, you know where you need to be and want to be. And I hope that you're ready to change your life and say, God, I want to put you first. You could do that this morning. Just ask him. If you're a child of God, you have the opportunity just to ask him. Father, help me do that. And then ask him over and over and over again. He never, he never tires of hearing it. And don't forget to tell him how much you love him and appreciate Amen. him for what he's done. If you're not a child of God and you want to become real, 
our elders are going to pass through the aisles here in just a few moments. They will receive you and help you with any decision that you need. Or if you would like to come forward, Chris and I will be down here. If there's a prayer request, there's a yellow, yellow card in front of you in the pew. Just take that and fill that out and give it to one of the men as they walk by. Visit with us afterwards. There'll be somebody in the library. We want you to be comfortable. But I want you to be comfortably uncomfortable until you're right with God. And then I want you to be comfortable in him. It's a kingdom thing. It's a God thing. And he has to be first. And if you're not right with him, do that today. Don't walk out of here not right with God. And if you need to, come while we stand and while we sing.